Hey, Dr. Rob. Good evening, Tammy. How are you? I'm good. So good to see you. So I, well, I have me to tell you. you. I got to, I'm going to start with this. I got to, I got to share just a little bit about my day. So today was a day where I had multiple partners call me that had called me six months or a year before. Uh -huh. And it, it's been, I got to tell you, it's a really challenging day when they're still struggling because nothing changed. And that's or you mean that, that their spouse didn't go to treatment or do anything. Is that what you're saying? Right. Right. So they're still, I was like, I've heard this story before. I literally was going like, I've heard the story before you called before. And I was like, Oh my gosh, if you like, if you took this and just transported it forward, they're in the same stuff. And that's hard. Well, as I've said to you before, and I don't mean this for everyone or any situation, but I think women are far too lenient on us. And I think kicking some of us out for a period of time or maybe for longer is a really good idea. Divorce lawyers are useful sometimes, even if you're just setting up a separation. But what I found with addicts, well, even cultures, we don't move unless there's pain. And clearly we are changing. Anyway, I'm not gonna go there, but I've never had someone come to me because things were great and they just had this little sex issue they wanted to get rid of. People come in because their spouse is gonna leave them or because they got a disease or because they could, anyway, I'm going on and on. But the point you're making is accurate that spouses will endure, some spouses will endure forever. And I'm not sure that's always the best course for either one of them, at least in the beginning. Well, and I, I said that, I, I, you know, I felt really bad, but I said, you know, you're going to call in at the end of the year and it's going to be the same unless something changes. So, so I, I, I appreciate you listening because that's been, it was hard today. So, so the first question, can you explain a little about arousal template? What is that? Can it change? If so, how? That's a great question. Um, so this is a um, colloquial term, a pop culture term. There's really no literature, like formal research on anything called an arousal template. So it's basically something from pop psychology, if you will. And the way we look at it is um, it's basically what turns you on and what doesn't. So if you're a heterosexual male who likes women of a certain age and you like them to look a certain way and maybe you enjoy this and that during sex and you don't enjoy these things, well, that's your arousal template. It's like a little map to what turns you on and what doesn't. And for some people, interesting that you asked the question, the arousal template can be expanded because people will find porn, for example, and then they'll get into something else and be like, wow, I didn't know I was into that. And so people will find themselves looking at things that they didn't know they were aroused by, but watching them and then becoming more aroused by. So it does go that way that um, arousal templates can get larger. But I rarely see an arousal template get smaller. So if I'm interested in men, I'm interested in men. If I'm interested in kink, I like kink. I can see people making choices, like I'm not going to have sex with women, I'm not going to have sex with men, I'm not going to uh, masturbate, I mean, whatever it is they choose not to do, but it's not going to, the fact that it interests them is not going to go away. Um, what turns you on, turns you on, whether you like it or you don't, whether your spouse likes it or they don't, and it is not changing for the most part. So the next question, are sponsors and sponsees generally friends as well? Is there a reason why they couldn't be? Um, I feel like I should let you answer this. It's such a dead on question for you, but I'll start quickly. Um, so I have learned in my life that when I deeply invite friends in, um, that it's a very different kind of relationship than I would want with a sponsor. Um, what I want for, I, I almost want a little bit of a one up. Like I want my sponsor to be a little ahead of me, a little more advanced, like they're the teacher and I'm the student. It's not perfect because they're only a little further along than me, but nonetheless, and friends are equals. You know, I don't have to be accountable to a friend unless I choose to. But if a sponsor says to me, I want you to do this and that, I just need to do it. Because it, it really is a relationship where that person is giving of their time um, to help someone else out. They're doing a service. And my friendship is not like, oh, they came over to be nice. It's they came over to have fun with me. So when someone is my sponsor, they're giving of themselves to me. And it's my job to follow them and take advantage of that and, and their support. It doesn't always happen that way in a friendship. What do you think, Tammy? I 100% I agree. And I think really, um, particularly early on, like get a sponsor that is you, that you can be accountable to, that can guide you, that's a teacher, all of those things. 
if you maintain a relationship with that person over right. time, you're going to become friends. And right. then the relationship almost changes. You're almost like peer sponsoring each other. That's a whole different thing. But early on, I, you know, yeah, I mean, my friends would not hold me as accountable as my sponsor would hold me accountable. And I really needed that in the guidance. We've had somebody ask on this before, like, can I just have a friend help me? And, and the difference is, you really need somebody who has done the work before and a friend who isn't an addict doesn't understand our brains. They really need to understand, you know, and have gone through it. So, so I really appreciate what is laid out for a sponsor to do is to help guide me through this path. And let me add one more thing. Friends can have opinions and judgments and I can't believe you slept with her. What were you thinking? And, and that's not part of a sponsorship relationship. It's their job to understand that we're no sicker than they are. And they're not going to wag their finger at us, but they're going to give us direction to heal. And I'm not sure that I would want to take direction from a friend, whereas I could understand a friend saying, what were you thinking? So it's just a whole different type of relationship. Yes. Okay. I've heard, Dr. Rava, I've heard you say things along the lines of it's a journey, not a destination, that we'll always be addicts and that we can never be cured. I, I actually use that today. Although I understand we may always be, um, I gotta put these on, I've got new contacts again. We may be predisposed, predisposed to certain behavior, being told that essentially there is no cure is very discouraging and even crushing. If I do the recovery work and don't resolve this issue, what's the point? I feel defeated before I start, any thoughts? Oh, that's a good one. I like that yeah, one. there's a difference between thoughts and action. Yeah. You will never stop wanting to act out under certain circumstances. It's, this is a form of emotional illness. When you have depression, when you're under certain kinds of stressors and you're not taking care of yourself, you're not, you might end up depressed again. If you have diabetes and you're not taking care of your blood sugar, you will end up in a crisis. If in our, the, the, First of all, this involves neurobiological stuff. It's in our brains. It's things that happen to us as well as who we are. So your, your desire to escape into alcohol, drugs, sex, whatever it is under emotional pressure um, is probably not gonna go away um, ever because that's how your brain was wired when you were much younger to disappear rather than move toward people for whatever reasons you run into your behavior. But we can learn, like I do, I still want to act out. It's been, oh, how many years? It doesn't even know, 35, 40 years. But I, some days I just like, oh my God, I would just love to have sex with a stranger today. And then I think, wow, that's really strange. I don't really want to have sex with a stranger. And then I call a friend. I know what to do. It's not at all crushing. If I said to you, you're going to be doing this the rest of your life, I wouldn't want to live. But what I'm saying to you is with a lot of hard work, support, community, self-knowledge, you cannot do this anymore forever or at least for long periods of time but the desire to do it is not going away and that's why i think the work that we have to do is a lot of heavy lifting like i want to be really when i i want to have good recovery muscles on meaning good people to talk to a good practice of daily living i want to have my stuff together um in a way that's going to support my healing so that when that desire comes along I know what to do and I have the right, I mean, one of the things we do in treatment, uh, you guys know we run a treatment program. I've run five, I have five different ones. The current one is Seeking Integrity. And one of the things we do is really help someone understand because it doesn't go away. We plan on that. So we're teaching people, huh, when you think about it, what are you gonna do? And when you might be walking toward it, what are you gonna do instead? Or when you start to plan out what you're gonna do tomorrow and it's not a good thing, what will you do tonight to make sure that doesn't happen? So we teach you how to recognize what's coming and then how to do something different. And we actually go through worksheets and all that. So um, it is a process of coming to terms with I have this problem. It's not gonna go away, but I can live with it if I manage it as a chronic problem like depression, like diabetes, like any chronic issue which may reappear, but when it reappears, I know what to do. I get back on my insulin, I change my diet, I don't have to go to the hospital. You know, I just have to say, oops, and then go back. Anyway, tell me, how was that? Do you have any thoughts? No, I, I, I use diabetes a lot because I think, you know, it's a chronic condition and I can do things on a daily basis that will manage my diabetes. I can, you know, eat right, exercise. I can do things that will help. And just like that, you can do things on a daily basis that, that help. What I don't have to be a slave to is the stuff I, I wanted the I mean, illness, the crap, the crap right. that my addiction, you know, caused me to struggle with. I am free from 
dishonesty, lies, chaos, shame, shame. Yes. A hundred percent shame, shame, shame. You know, all of those things. I, you know, I got the freedom to not have to deal with that. That's huge. I will, I will take that today. And it's only for today, only for today. I just need to do some things. Sammy, that, you're freezing up and I'm not sure if it's oh. you or me. Uh, you might want to use your background because I, I can lose my background sure. probably. So then let's see if I've left everyone. Uh, I think you guys are here. So let me text. Can you oh, hear me? You yes. I think we lost you. You Completely lost me. Froze. I got rid of my background as you suggested. Sorry about so. that. No, it's a, yeah, it's all good. It's just my cluttered office. So, but anyway. So you were I have saying, a daily reprieve if I do what I am is suggested to do. I can live with my chronic condition like diabetes. I can I can live a healthy life. I am really happy. But it's not a but, life sentence. Go ahead. But the first step in all these 12 steps and really in therapy is you have to admit you have a problem and you need help. And if you admit, you, it sounds like you admit to have, you admit to having the problem, but you haven't gotten to the part where, oh, I can get help. So you're with, oh my God, I've got this problem forever. No, the other part of it is that if you acknowledge you have it, then there's strength. Look, if you go around and say, oh, I don't want to pay attention to this and I'll just live through it and maybe it'll go away or I'll do some therapy, you'll struggle with the rest of your life. If you say, I, I understand what a deep, challenging wound this is, and I'm willing to go ahead on a regular basis to make sure I don't end up at the worst part of it, you'll have some a good life. Not the same life as healthy people, but a good life. Well, you mentioned deep, challenging wound. I, a partner used this analogy one time. She said, you know, th there's this deep wound, and rather than putting a Band-Aid on it, you need antibiotic. And I was like, yes, it's a systemic thing, and I need to get, I need to get the underlying issues dealt with, and just sticking a Band-Aid on it I, yeah, isn't going to cure me, but I can, I can get help. I can get different. So. Okay, I want to, you're right. I'd like the Band-Aid. I love that part. Um, so I have one short analogy for all of you. Okay. I think it's, it's how I, I just, how I really think about this. And I mean, our whole recovery process. So we're broken. I'm not as healthy as many other people are. I have a lot of challenges. And the fact that I've gotten to be, uh, have a life, have a partner, have friends, feel good about my life. That's a lot of progress compared to where I was. So, but it took a lot of hard work. It took a lot of support. And so here's my metaphor for you, metaphor for everyone. Um, I think healthy people, and I've met some, they have really good genes, they have great parenting, they love their sisters and brothers, they can't wait to get home for Thanksgiving. I mean, all those folks, I don't relate to them. But anyway, I believe if you look at life like a track, that those people get on that track and they just start running and maybe they get a little tired, they, they get some water, but they pretty much, you know, the family, the kids, the education, the grant, I mean, they make it around the track without a lot of struggle. They might change their relationship, whatever, but a lot of us struggle. We are going to struggle all the way. And the way I really like to explain this is, you know, we too will get around the track, but we might need crutches. We might need someone to hold our hand and help us get to the next. We will get around the track, but we'll never do it like those other people do. It's going to take a lot of support and a lot of work. And I think if you acknowledge that, that's the power. I acknowledge that I'm not someone who could just get out there and run. I'm going to need help. I can get there. I can get all those good things that everyone else has, but I'm going to need work. I need, need support throughout my lifetime in some form or another. And if you can be okay with that, it's a very hopeful journey. Well, and so where my mind went is not on crutches, but I've got people arm in arm with me and we're, you know, we're continuing to make progress on it. And that's really what this program, you know, the recovery is, is about a journey with other people where addiction is all about me and very selfish and, and small. And, you know, I have people like, anything's going on in my life, I have people I can pick up the phone and call and they will listen. Even if I'm, you know, even if I just need to vent because I have those relationships and I didn't have that when I was acting out. So ready for the next one. I'm a single gay man. I read cruise control and sex addiction 101 in my sexual acting out. I start with masturbation and then it escalates to porn, then to more intense porn and then online hookup sites. And finally a sex binge with multiple men over one or two days. I, it was recommended to have a period of sexual abstinence and I have a sexual recovery plan. I tried that before and I broke all the rules in my plan. How can I stop this escalation? Well, one of the things I want to know, and, and I, we may not get the answer is are drugs involved? 
because when people go off for sex for a couple of days, um, I mean, unless you're, I don't know how old you are, but once I hit about 30, it was really hard to get, stay up much more than two in the morning. <laughs> so um, unless I had drugs. So one of the things, and I know gay men often show, disappear with meth and ketamine and crystal, all kinds of things and crystals meth, and they go off and they disappear for a couple of days and have sex. So I don't know if you're talking about that kind of a binge or whether you're simply more sort of, sort of, I mean, simply, um, fixing my light here. If you're just more talking about um, that you have this escalating process of sexual behavior that you don't feel good about and it makes you hate yourself um, because they're kind of different issues. Um, so Tammy, do you have a thought about, because there's a lot of stuff in there. You have a thought about what you might start with? Well, it's a real beginner kind of. Right. And I'm like, you have shared in the past, Dr. Rob, that if what you're doing isn't enough, up the level. So are you working with a, a, a qualified therapist? And mm -hmm. um, if you are, maybe you need to see the therapist twice a week. Are you doing individual and group? And if all of that isn't enough to stop, you know, then call us, Seeking Integrity Los Angeles. Like, this is what we do is we help guys like you that, you know, stop the, you know, acting out behavior. So. But I do want to say something to you are as a gay man, you know, you're not going to get a lot of support from your culture. You go to bars, you go hang out with people, they're getting laid as much as they want, you know, and they don't necessarily have the need to change their behavior like you do. So you must, must go to 12 step meetings and really listen to what other people are going through that aren't having fun out there having sex. And, you know, you can do this alone or you can do this with help. And what I hear in this story is I said all the rules and that I broke them. That's somebody who tried to do it by themselves. Um, what I would say is I sat down with someone and I worked on the rules and then I became accountable to them. And then I would talk to them on a regular basis about my ability to follow them or not. But I think you're trying to do it on your own or you're just, I mean, of course you're going to, the whole definition of being an addict is you don't have control over this as much as you might want to. So um, you can white knuckle it, we call that, where you just hold onto the chair and say, I'm not going to get out there, but eventually those fingers are going to get tired and you're going to go out. So rather than saying, uh, why can't I get this? What I would be saying is, uh, what are you writing? Like Tammy said, what are the things you're going to go out there and do so that you don't have to do this by yourself? And you know what? One more thing. Sorry. I remember for years thinking, I'm never going to get better. I'm never going get to get better. And then I'd be around people who'd say, but I'm better and I'm better. And I think you can get better. And they held on to me when I didn't have hope. I, I would go and think, this is ridiculous. I'm wasting my time. At least I'm not out having sex with strangers. But you know, what am I going to get out of this? And they would comfort me and they would support me and they'd ask me out to dinner and we'd spend time together and slowly but surely, I not only got out of the pain I was in, but I started to think about how life could be different. It wasn't like that at the beginning. I was very hopeless at the beginning, but I kept showing up. And that I think is the most important part, not giving up, being willing to say, I'm going to keep working at this until it gets better, but not by myself. So at 6.05 on sexandrelationshiphealing.com, 6.05 Pacific time. Tonight. It is the cruise control group. Skip Spear is the moderator. I highly recommend that you connect with that group. That's a good place to start. So okay. it's free and it's, it's at free. 6.05 on sex and relationship healing. And yes. the, it is the gay man's group that we run for people who are struggling with sex addiction. So drop in. Uh, hi, Dr. Robin Tammy. I went, or I want to get your thoughts regarding dating. I am still in recovery, but the idea of making myself open again to date has come to mind. The reason is I have seen attractive women out in person. I have missed opportunities due to wanting to heal first, then date. What are your thoughts about dating while in recovery? Um, well, I think date, oops. Oh, here we go, sorry. I'm gonna, ch I'm changing my ears up. There we go. Um, so can you, use, okay. I can hear you. Can you Great. So I think dating is part of recovery. In other words, um, some people think that recovery is stopping the behavior. Like I'm going to stop drinking or I'm going to stop sexing with strangers or whatever that is. And that's, I think, in some ways, the easiest part. The harder part is how are you going to live your life? How are you going to get, not drink in the future or not do this? So I think it's really about like what kind of, what kind of support you're getting, relationships you're getting. But I would not, so I say this on Friday night, on Friday night all the time, because it's a lot of women. Um, when I was in my recovery and working on it actively, 
I never made a decision about dating that I didn't run by someone else. I never made a decision about sex that I didn't run by someone else. I already had those people in place because I'd been working a good program and I had friends and I had a sponsor. So it's very easy to say, okay, I think I'm ready to date. Here's my dating criteria, the people I want to go out with. Here's what a date is, you know, not meeting someone for half an hour and going to their house. So all of that, just like you might have a recovery plan for sex, you're going to need a recovery plan for dating. And developing that plan, um, going through your history, talking to those people, that could take a few months, but it doesn't mean you can't start dating even in the process, but a date is uh, a one hour sit down in a crowded, crowded, ugly coffee shop because you don't want romance and fire and evening and all that stuff when your first date, you want to see these people clearly. By the way, we, we could practicing dating is a really good thing. And for you single people, single people out there, I will say that um, most of you give up too soon. Um, dating is kind of a numbers game. And unless you, if you, everyone you meet, you fall in love with and you lose yourself to for a year, then you're never really dating. But dating is about meeting a whole series of people and learning, could I be friends with them? Would I enjoy them? Am I attracted to them? I went to a conference once, Tammy, you'll hate this. They said you had to date 12 to 15 people a year, different ones, before you'd actually find the right person for you. And I think, oh my goodness, some of us settle way too quickly because we're so much want to be in a relationship that and this is love addiction. I, I don't see that person at all. I just so oh, and they're there, and now they're there, and 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 now my my hole is plugged, my unhappiness, my emptiness is plugged up. As long as they're there, and that you know that's not it. Picking the right person is it. So anyway, yes, you're ready to date when you have those people in place, when you have a plan in place, and most of all, when you're committed to be accountable to others around dating. Because I never want to be in a dating situation by myself. Because inevitably, I'll be thinking, oh, this person's really attractive and really, when I really like us together, of course, they're using heroin and they're still with their ex-wife. But hey, it's, you know, we, we will do that in our heads. So we need guidance. So the next one, does porn have any effect on attraction? I'm a black man and have attracted to white women more than other races all my life, even before porn. However, porn has led me to think that porn has an influence on what I like especially after I binge um, to porn. I try to find the facts, but I know what I'm attracted to, but porn tries to tell me otherwise. And this kind of feels like the arousal template you were talking about earlier. Yeah, well, if something doesn't turn you on, you're not gonna masturbate to it. If something doesn't interest you on some level, some people think this like, and I can understand it. Well, if I look at a lot of porn, maybe the porn is bringing me into things that don't turn me on. And I don't, and, and I, for example, I, I, someone will watch porn for a while, let's say just people, and then they're into couples and then into threesomes and then they start to get into BDSM. And then they might be into some pretty heavy stuff online. And they're like, wow, I never thought I would be into this. It must be the porn that did it. The porn led me here. And then that's, you know, it really doesn't work that way. The way it works is if something turns you on in porn or, or otherwise, there has to be some kind of interest inside of you for or there was it wouldn't ring a bell now if you're not into snm you never knew you were into snm but you found yourself with some you know people slapping and tickling each other and you thought ooh, that's kind of fun there was always a part of you that maybe would have enjoyed a little bit of tension anger whatever it is in your sexuality you just didn't know it yet and the reason i say this is uh, i'll just be as direct as i can you know i'm a gay guy and uh i've been with men for 40 years now, maybe 30. And I can tell you that I think boobs are great. Like boobs, when I look at boobs, I think, oh, what would they, what would look good on them? Like that's, a, I'm a gay guy. I'm like, what would, what dress would look good with those boobs? But I don't think, oh, boobs, I can't wait to be with a pair. And I could look at porn all day long. Boobs here, boobs there. Wouldn't do a thing for me. I would just be thinking what to put on them because I'm not interested in boobs. So just looking at something over and over again, in which you have you know, no real arousal, it's not in your template, you're just gonna say, well, that's nice to look at, but it doesn't really do anything for me. Or you might say, oh, I don't really like that at all. But when you find yourself turned on by something, whether you expected it or not, it's actually a part of you that is ringing like a bell. And um, by the way, lots of people engage in online fantasy behavior. They are having sex online in porn with white women, dark women, big women, small women, tied up, all that. But when they go out in the world, they're not so interested in doing that. They want to have just a regular relationship with someone, so to speak. So sometimes we act things out in porn that we don't necessarily want to bring into our real lives, but it's kind of fun in the porn. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but- I think they did a great job with answering that question. Oh, Thank you. Thanks, Tim. 
Okay, so the next question is, what would you say are the top three things to look for when I'm looking for a good CSAT? And like, so a CSAT, for those of you, it's a certified sex addiction therapist. So, because we use a lot of letters, but so what would you think would be the top three things in looking for? Well, the first thing I would do is write Tammy a note. And Tammy ran the CSAT organization for about 12 years. And so she knows so many of those experts. And the reason that we're able to make so many referrals for you guys is not that we get $20 from every therapist we refer to, although I kind of wish we did, but it's not legal. But any, we could use the money. But anyway, um, but we, she knows in particular a network of therapists around the world because she helped with their trainings. And so the first thing I would do, honestly, is write Tammy at Seeking Integrity. The reason I say that is because some just because someone got a particular specialty doesn't mean they know what they're doing and some people get a specialty but they don't know how to do that work or or they can do that but someone has underlying issues like trauma or mental illness and they don't see it so you still have to be a re really a well-rounded mental health professional i think to then go into addiction work and then the csat but some people who are fairly new just oh i want to get the csat but they don't really know what they're doing so when we refer to you for you, we're really picking someone that we think, not only you've told us your story, we want to get through the right male or a female, but also um, we really know who's good and who isn't. So Tammy, that's my number one go-to. What would you say two and three are? I well, think, yeah, go ahead. You know, I think that, that that is important. And there were, I, you know, I love the CSAT community and there were some I would send my family to and there are some I would never refer to ever. I just, you know, I mean, and that's just the reality. Um, I, I also think what you started talking about, Dr. Rob, with like we, you know, your story, because there are some of them that are more in this niche and this, you know, or this specialization. So, so for example, I, you know, I talk to people when they come to seeking integrity treatment program, you know, the clinicians have worked with them for 14 days they know that person and they know we need a therapist that is that has this, this, and this, you know, and I can help refine that list. So it isn't just the, you know, looking for, you know, better therapists on that list. It's, you know, a discerning what, you know, really is going on. So, so, uh, you know, and I think at some point people go, you know, I really like my therapist and I'm going like, you know, liking your therapist would be not on my list. What is that therapist helping you achieve your goals? Dr. Rob has talked about what is your goal in coming to treatment? Is it, I want to stop this behavior. I want to, whatever. If they're helping you be successful in that, that's a good fit, whether you like them or not. And in fact, if you like your therapist too much, that might be a problem. They may not be holding you accountable enough. Well, and I also say that, I mean, just to say it, like, um, I would want to have a, if I was starting therapy for depression, I would ha want to have someone really warm and really nurturing and really supportive because I'm a little fragile and I don't even know if I want to live and this person's lending me hope and supporting me and I would want to really feel a loving relationship with them, at least supported. But if I'm an addict, well, let me say this, as a, someone who's treated addicts for many, many years, I've always said I'd rather be respected than liked because in the beginning, I'm going to say a lot of things you don't like. Why'd you do this? Why are you doing that? What change this, change that. And you're going to say, I can't stand that guy. He's making me talk about all these things that I've avoided talking about for 30 years. And now I have to look at them all at once and I can't stand them. And he's showing it to me like this, like straight on. This is what it is. When I've tried so many times to say, well, it's their fault and their fault. And, and so I will feed you that very directly. And that can be really upsetting. I've had many people in ter therapy say, well, treatment say, you know, I hated you at the beginning because you said things I just didn't want to hear. But when I had some time to sit back and think about it, I realized you're probably my best friend because no one would ever say that to me in such a clear, direct way. And I have to pay attention. So um, I'm not sure how I got there, Tammy, but I, I hopefully I answered the question. It was good. So the next question is recommendations for resources for healing your inner child. I, so Eddie Caparucci just did a podcast with Dr. Rob on sex, love, and addiction about going deeper and healing your inner child. He also um, has done webinars. He is week three on the Wednesday series, and those are on the previously recorded. Um, and he is starting a training so that other therapists can help people really do that. So I don't know who's, I mean, he's just starting that, that training. Um, so, so that's my focus on that. I love his work. He did uh, the In the Room Super Saturday Recovery Summit last week. So I wanted weekend. to say, don't we have yeah. a link to that? Couldn't we? I do. Yes. Uh -huh. um, I got to. If they uh, want, so 
his name is Eddie Caparucci. Yes. And Eddie is a therapist who's particularly focused on um, what we call internal family systems or looking at your inner child, your adult child, you know, all the different parts inside of you, because that's one way of doing therapy. And he talks a lot about that every third week of the month in the group that he does for us on sex and relationship healing. But he also recently volunteered uh, to do a one hour seminar for us on another platform that we work on, work with, and vol we both volunteer for. And so he did one hour, I think it was last weekend, two weekends it ago? It was the, yeah, two weekends ago. My and so these was. get recorded, um, these hours get recorded, and Tammy's working hard to just put that in the chat. But each, uh, once a month on intherooms.com, which is a 12-step website. By the way, if you're not familiar, intherooms.com has about 175 12-step meetings a week. So if you're looking to go to a meeting and you're stuck at home for whatever reason, since some of us are stuck at home right now, um, go to intherooms.com and go to some of their meetings. I volunteer there every Friday night at 6 p.m. So if you feel like, oh my God, I had questions here, they get answered. Well, number one, you can write me, rob at seekingintegrity.com and I'll try to answer your question. But also you can come by on Friday night at six o'clock California time on In The Rooms. And I'm there answering questions and doing that, but I don't have lo the lovely Tammy with me on Fridays. But the last thing I wanna say about that is is, um, is um, sorry, uh, go see the webinar that Eddie did for the In the Rooms folks. Tammy will send you, or you can just go In I the Rooms. I just put it in chat. Right. I, I put all those links so you can find the webinar. He did two um, different webinars. He broke it down. He had a little more time on our webinar series. So it's in ours, but then he did um, a, a, yeah, less than an hour on, on In the Rooms, and I gave you links to both of that and the podcast that he did with you, Dr. Rob. By the way, where does it, uh, he live in case someone wanted to see him? He's you know? in Georgia, the Atlanta Georgia. area. So yeah, okay. if you are um, if you are in that area, you can you can uh, or anywhere licensed, in Georgia. Right, he's licensed in 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 Georgia. So yes, mm -hmm. so um, but I you know I love I love that work. So let me say something else to these folks just about mm -hmm. what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, just so you know, none of us in this country. No therapist, no PhD, no masters, none of us. We cannot do therapy outside the state that we live in. We're, our, our, the rules, if you will, or the laws were written for an analog time. So, you know, no one was going to be online doing therapy to in someone in North Carolina if you were licensed in California because you couldn't. They, you, you wouldn't want to do it on a phone, you, but now we can see each other. But the laws have not changed. So, for example, we recommended Eddie. He's an amazing therapist, but he's licensed in Georgia. He can only see people in the state of Georgia. So what we're trying to do, I just want to say this, is we've, we, what we can do is educate. So we can do a whole series, like we have a classroom series going on for the introduction to sex addiction, right? Or introduction to healing. It's so for, but yeah, introduction for porn and sex addiction. It starts, the next class for men starts July 1st. So this Wednesday, and there's a, only a handful of spots left. Thank you, Tammy. My point was, Tammy is ever the salesperson. You're very, but my point is, is that- Resource. Um, if you can, you know, there are things that therapy doesn't give that that's a lot of supplemental education work and you can get those pieces uh, with us or others. Um, but there's another part of that question, Tammy, because I think it's gone now. It was resources for uh, healing your inner child. Right, well, we, we answered, good. talk to Eddie. Okay. Oh, one more thing. There's a great website on trauma. If anybody's looking for anything, oh, yeah. EMDR, somatic, and it's called um, traumamadesimple.com. Yes. And yes. it's by Jamie Marich, who's also did a talk on In the Rooms lately. And it's a wonderful, like if you're just looking to understand trauma, what is it about basic articles? What is EMDR? What is somatic therapy? It's called, um, uh, I just said it. It's traumamadesimple.com. Trauma and made I just simple. type it. And uh, it's a great place to get resources. And on that link that I put in there that um, has the um, In the Rooms, um, I did do that. Yes, the Saturday Recovery Summit. Jamie Marich did um, an In the Rooms the same day that um, Eddie Caparucci did. So you can see both of those. So it was, She's great. Yes, it was good. So, okay, next question. I'm a recovering sex and love addict, finding that when I am visiting with my wife, I find myself triggered by her physical beauty. Any ideas on how to shift focus away from objectifying her as an object of lust, or should I be establishing no contact boundaries? This is his wife? Yes. So I, I guess I don't understand the question because I would hope that you're attracted to your wife. I would hope that you find her interesting and arousing, especially if you're no longer having sex with other people and not measuring the porn all the time and all that's gone away. Um, yeah, you're 
going to look at whoever's naked around you and think they look pretty good. So I don't think there's anything wrong with objectifying your spouse. I know a lot of people would like to say, oh my God, we've been married 10 years and he's still looking at that. That's actually kind of a good feeling. But I think what might be missing is communication. So when I'm objectifying someone, I look at this, look at that, look at their arms, look at their whatever, I'm not seeing them as a whole person. So for me, in your situation, if I found myself aroused and feeling excited about my spouse, I'd probably walk up to them and say, you know, I'm feeling kind of aroused and excited about you tonight. How are you feeling toward me? And would it be okay to kiss? And in other words, I think for us, it's about being very open and negotiating. And what I wouldn't do, and it may seem subtle, but I wouldn't, is start looking at my spouse, looking them up and down, having those, and then rush over to them and, and try to be romantic or sexual. They might join me, but they won't understand where it comes from. And I will doubt myself. So if there's communication, um, I think that will help a lot. One more thing. I hope you have a sponsor. I hope you have a 12-step program. I hope you have a therapist. So I, remember, I didn't make any sexual decisions for a long time unless I ran it by other people. That included with people I was dating or engaged with. So I could be dating someone for someone three months, maybe not married, and say, gee, I'm not sure if I should be sexual right now. Let me know. And I would call them. So, and by the way, one more thing. You can tell your wife this. You know, I look at you a lot and I just think about sex and I romanticize and sexualize you. And I don't know if it's good or bad, but I really do have these feelings and, you know, um, I'm working on it. Um, how do you feel when you're walking by and I look at your butt? How do you feel? You know, talk about it. Just talk about it. That's the best gift you could give yourself. I noticed you say um, when I visit with my wife. And so I'm not sure if that's visit like in the uh, old Iowa way, like we went to visit and we were sitting there chatting or if you physically aren't together and you, you know, so, so when you do physically um, are in the same um, place. So, so I don't know if that factors in, what do you think? Um, well, yeah, if you're visiting and maybe you've been kicked out, um, one of the ways we sexualize everything. It's part of being a sex addict. I can sexualize a rock, a pen. It doesn't matter. I'm always the one to make the first sexual joke. As many of you are, I'll always find this sexual humor. We sexualize. So um, if you're not seeing your spouse very often and you're missing them and all that stuff and you engage with them, I can imagine that might be a lot of sexual energy because a lot of emotions are spinning around for you. But again, it's not good. It's not bad. It's something to negotiate. And by the way, if you're not being sexual with your spouse right now, uh, you can tell her, I, I find you very attractive, but I'm not doing that right now. But I can't decide that for you. Your sponsor decides, your therapist decides, your spouse decides. What does it mean? How does it feel? Just talk about it. Yeah, I think that what does it mean? I think that's really important. So, so the next question. My husband and I stopped having sex regularly more than a year ago. I simply can't have any desire to have sex with him, and he never gives me any pleasure. It's weird. I'm borderline, and I'm triggered by his indifference, coldness, and by his materialism. By the way, I do not know what I should do. So, hmm. what's the question in there? I, don't I understand see the all the terms. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't see the question. So, what's the beginning of it? I wanted to say. My husband about. and I stopped having sex regularly more than one year ago. I simply cannot. Uh -huh. I don't. There's no desire. It, it does not sound so, like an affirming um, relationship. He's cold and it, right. it doesn't. If you're borderline, as this woman says that she is, that means that you can, you really, um, you're very attracted to people who are narcissistic. And this is often a good fit because narcissistic people are terrified of abandonment, even though they look fabulous on the outside. And people who are somewhat borderline will never abandon you because they're even more terrified of abandonment. So, but just being afraid of being left is not a reason to be with someone. So, um, you know, I don't have a real answer because I'm not in your picture, but I will say this. I think you guys need to be talking. The longer a couple goes without sex, the longer, you know, does he want to have sex with you? Does he mind that you're not being sexual? How does he feel about it? What does it mean? Again, I, I, I don't mean to be trite. I don't even know if that's a word anymore. But um, but far too many issues come up that we just don't, oh, we are ashamed, we're embarrassed. We think, oh, I'm doing something bad. And we don't tell the person we're closest to. This is the greatest pain to any spouses. I didn't know you were thinking that. Why didn't you tell me that? If you'd felt that way, I would have, or if you'd, we talked about it, I could have, and Tammy was just talking to, so I don't know if some of you guys know I do consultations, and they're not therapy. I sit down and I listen to what's going on with a, with a couple because I'm really good at evaluation. And at the end of that, my job is to say, well, I think this would be a good idea. Like, you should look at this, you should do that. You know, do you need treatment, do you need therapy, do you need whatever, books? I do these evaluations, and I was talking to a couple today, and it was just really clear to me that um, 
that um, that they'd gone such a long time without a sexual life that it was really going to be a hard thing to revive. And they weren't talking about it. They just stopped. So do yourself a favor. Do him a favor. Oh, and by the way, you may find yourself more attracted than you think when you open up emotionally. You start saying things like, I feel like distant from you and I've not been avoiding sex from you. And that's actually being intimate. That's the start of something good. So don't ask me, ask him. <laughs> Poor Tammy, she's got her glasses on, she's choking. Boy, she's having a bad night tonight. Hey, Tammy, when you put your glasses on, should I take mine off and then you put yours on and I'll... Like that? Okay, what do we got going here? Mm, sorry. I'll read the question. Tammy's choking. You want me to read the question? Okay. Um, so far in our recovery, my recovery as the betrayed, his recovery as the addict, are in such polar opposites of the spectrum. He's healing and having such riches as he was learning about himself and working on the recovery process, the steps I spiraled into the abyss of the unknown. How long does it take for the recoveries or this rhythm to match it for us to get together? I'm in three groups. I have a CSAT therapist, he's a sponsor, blah, blah, blah. We are 14 months in. So are you able to talk? yet okay so did you hear the question so how would you i mean you talk to so many spouses when they're in a crisis and my my sense about this is it, i'm not sure how she said 14 months but 14 months since what like since the disclosure since anyway tell me what you think tammy hopefully my voice is back so what i what i was thinking was you use the track analogy and right. You know, if and you use this a couple of weeks ago, and I thought, oh, that's such a good one because you know, you're on the same track, and at some point, you know, you will catch up with each other if you remember you're on the same track. So it does take partners a lot longer. I mean, there's very specific things addicts can do to stop the behavior and you know do do things differently, and partners are left with. You know, is he really trustworthy? Is he really changing? You know, and or she. all of y yes, he or she. So yeah, you know, it, it, had things really shifted and having to deal with has everything that I thought been a lie. I mean, all of that. It's a process, and it's grieving the loss of that and looking for the new reality and watching for those moments where you go, yeah, I think he's or she is telling the truth, and I think there, I think I see changes can't really trust it so so being in a different place is pretty common i you know i suspect it takes longer than that but i also think if as long as you guys can see that you're still you know on the same track or you're still going in the same path you know that's hopeful you know and hope I, 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 even with the track i like the track better than the path because i think with the track it's like even if somebody's doing laps around you they're still going to be at the same spot as you once you know every time you're in that spot so so it's it's okay and i think give yourself both the grace to understand it's you know it is a journey it is a process there isn't like a finish line where you go okay now we've both arrived that isn't the case thanks tammy i think that i really appreciate your encouragement and um i just want to validate like you are in different places and actually that's how it should be so an addict in early recovery is thinking, oh my God, I hate myself. I can't believe I did all this, but there's some hope. And there's these other people who are getting well and I can get well too. And oh, now I've told someone about everything and I don't have any more secrets anymore and I'm not lying anymore. And, and they start to feel pretty good about themselves as you should, because they've been working hard and they're improving themselves and they feel less self-hatred and feel like they would be a better partner. But at the same time, you've been devastated and your life has fallen apart and you're just wondering how to make the next step or where to go and they're like oh my life's going better and you're like oh my god i want to die so it is absolutely true that you're going in different directions at the same time you, i want to make that normal this is one of the reasons why we tell you spouses and addicts not to lean into each other right now because you're in different places so your addict needs to go to groups and support where people are like woohoo good for you you're getting that time together and you need to go to groups and support where people are saying boy that's really hard i'm so sorry that's hard for me too so you're even doing different work you're recovering from trauma 
That's why I wrote this book, Pro Dependence. It's nothing wrong with you. It's you're recovering from the trauma of living with this crazy person, but he or she needs to do a lot of work on not acting out and stopping their addiction. And you're going to be in different places for a while. But what I really like what Tammy said, if you could establish just a little neutral criteria, like he could say to you, you know, I want you to let you know that these are a couple of signs about, of my healing that I feel good about. You know, I've been going to these meetings. I haven't, so that you can s at least notice. I'm not saying go woohoo, but you can feel like, okay, I see some markers and here's the next step. Whoops, I'm never gonna keep cups on my, I just never, anyway. For you, um, what are your markers? Like, are you, are there a few moments when you feel closer? Are there some times when you can appreciate what's going on? Do you feel sometimes like you're being seen and you're getting empathy? Are there moments when you can be other, like, so Tammy said it, where do you meet? Just even the littlest of things. And Tammy, I'm going to clean up the water I spill over the desk. Can you talk okay. about dog, dog house? Yes, I can. I, I don't, don't, that fits here. Yes, I was going to say, I usually have, um, this is one version, there's two, but there's, a, Dr. Rob wrote uh, two different versions. This is the, um, uh, this is the original. So this is the out of the dog house for men caught cheating, but it really is such a great book for, I like, do you like the stripes? Like I matched my shirt. This is ridiculous. We're having technical issues today, but anyway, um, but it's for uh, rebuilding trust. And it's really very like, do this, you know, like if you say you're going to show up, you show up. If you say you're going to take out the trash, you take out the trash. You know, if I lied about something, I'm going to tell you within a short amount of time. And I'm going to say, I was afraid, you know, of your reaction. I was afraid I was going to hurt you, whatever. But the, it's practical tools for doing things different. So I think, um, uh, you know, I think you'll, appreciate that. I, I'm, I'm going to give you, because he's gone, I'm going to give you a, um, a preview of something we're working on. So we started the men's uh, sex and porn addiction, you know, working through the work group. It's a work group to work through the workbook. So um, we're now in the process of planning a couple's lecture series with Dr. Rob that will begin in yeah, probably August 1st. I, I should have the rest of the details up this week, but I just want to let you know that that is coming. So it'll be an online lecture series for couples with Dr. Rob. Stay tuned. Okay, you're back. Next. Can question. I ask you a question? Can I have a question? Yeah. Why do I keep knocking glasses over? Why can't I? I swear because to God, Because you a and day, I talk with our hands. That's why. Uh, it's well, then a, it's I, need a sippy thing. I need a sippy cup. <laughs> a lidded cup. Yes. Yes. Great idea. Can you I have actually one? You need one, one that has one of the rocking bottoms, like the, the little sippy cups so that, you know, oh, weebles wobble. Okay, thank you. You solved a big problem for me. Let's move on. Happy to help. Okay. Um, I'm curious if you have any advice on how to deal with vivid dreams about acting out. I find it really affects me sometimes. I try to start my morning off right with SAA literature and continue on a good routine, but sometimes it's awfully hard to shake. Um, well, two things. Just in terms of the physical like in case having these dreams and stuff leaves you really aroused in the morning, my best uh, recommendation is get out of bed. <laughs> Just get out of bed. Like if you sit there and you indulge the fantasies and the thoughts, you can get really stuck. Um, the other thing is that I think, I don't know where you are in your recovery, but I hear this a lot from people who are, and Pammy, Tammy probably does too, people in their first year or so, as they're kind of shedding it, it's almost like they wake up and they think, oh, I was just doing, it. oh, I'm, I wasn't. You know, I think people who are in early recovery from alcohol might have drinking dreams. And it's like there's a part of us that's being cleansed, that's being worked through. And, and so we can have this. I think it's a good sign because instead of it acting out, it's sort of going into your subconscious. Um, but I also think you need to take care of yourself. You might need to, and listen, if it's the middle of the night, you get out of bed, watch some TV. You know, I've, I've had people say like, oh, I can't sleep. I keep tossing and turning. Get out of bed. <laughs> Watch some TV. It'll get better later. And if you feel like acting out or you're really uncomfortable, you know, go have some coffee. You'll be better later. But in truth, this is normal or healthy. And I think it's a good sign. And, and so I had a, a situation a couple of years ago and it, it caused some trauma. And I had dreams very vivid like that for like 10 months. And, and then they finally stopped. But I knew it, I was processing internally like you're talking about. And the best thing I did was talk about it. Like if I just acknowledged it, I, you know, I acknowledged that this is what was happening and whatever, I, like that really helped me a lot. So, um, so yeah, get out of bed, go do something else. Understand it's just a dream and it's part of the process and there's, you know, no harm, no foul. You had a vivid dream, 
but it it's you know it's not you know something's going on thank you for helping me you know work through this you know maybe be grateful for it and and you know move on it. yeah start your day so um is there any hope for a marriage when the betrayed spouse has zero desire for the betraying spouse what does zero desire you mean sexual desire it doesn't want to it's, what does that mean yeah um because I, let me just say one thing if it is a betrayed spouse and someone's the addict and they're saying my spouse has no sexual desire toward me is that what's being said well i i it sounds like at least sexual desire but maybe even like i just don't even want to you know if they're pushing away so well i i wouldn't expect any spouse to feel desirous of any so let me try this again or, or and again i just want to say this um you spouses have been betrayed you have a job in your first year other than taking care of yourself and working through the trauma of being betrayed and getting support in terms of the addict, you have two jobs. One is to hate his guts or hers. And the other is to decide whether you want to leave or stay. That's all you have to do. That's your whole job is to decide whether you want to leave or stay and, um, and, uh, hate them. So, um, it's really early. If it's fairly early, like first year, year and a half, I wouldn't expect a spouse to have any desire for me or any interest in me. I would expect whether they want to kill me. Um, and so, and by the way, let me say this, I, this is why I wrote out of the doghouse. Men in particular, my experience, we hurt somebody, especially a woman, and we think, well, I'll send candy and flowers and I'll call them every day and we'll think, plan some kind of thing together. And then in about a couple of months, they're going to get over this because, well, it's been three or four months and I'm doing a lot better. And I still, still see that unhappy face every time I walk in the door. When are you going to get over it? It's been six months. As Tammy said, it can take a very long time, maybe a year or more, before a partner might even want to be in a bed with you or even stay in the same room with you. So I, it depends on how, on what you consider to be progress and what your timeline is. Um, because I think after a few months, if two people are sitting down at a breakfast table and can stand each other and have a conversation, that's pretty good. So the next one, I'm having trouble to find support and support groups as well as a sponsor. In the moment, I can't afford therapy. I'm very, it's, I'm very depressed. Can you help me find resources with support groups for a sex and love addict as me? Yes, you're on one of them, sexandrelationshiphealing.com. There are, there, there's a separate group for female sex and love addicts. They're at 6.05 Pacific time tonight. There's a group for gay men. There was a group for men this morning. There was a group for men last night. There was a betrayed partner group last night. You get the picture. There's more. So all free, all free. The podcast, Sex, Love and Addiction that Dr. Rob has, all free. Lots and lots of great guests. So there's a lot of uh, things. The, the depressive stuff, though, can you talk to that a little bit, please, Dr. Rob? Well, um, if you're, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you can sign up at a local mental health clinic and they'll see you in four months or whenever they see you. And you can talk about depression and they'll put you on medication and deal with it if that's needed. It, it's a shame you can't get there faster, but without private insurance or it just, or without, it just doesn't happen. But community clinics are available. And especially during COVID, there's a lot more attention to people needing mental health and there's a lot more opportunities to get it. So just in terms of mental health, I'd be searching for free therapy, free mental health, free psychiatry, you know, see what you can find in your community. Um, the other thing is just um, every 12-step group is free and every 12-step group you're welcome in. And Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, Sex Addicts Anonymous, especially online where there are a lot of women, um, you'll feel a lot more comfortable than you might walking into a room with 12 men in a 12-step in a program uh, live. 12-step programs on online are like 100 people and half of them are women. So um, if you are available on Friday evenings, you should really consider coming to my intherooms.com group on in the rooms, just to say it, not that we don't have a lovely turnout here. We, every week, Tammy, we got 50, 60 people. It's great, but I have 275 people on Friday nights and half of them are women struggling with sex and intimacy issues. Um, they come up and say, I'm a lesbian in this, or I'm a woman in this. And so please stop by on Friday nights. And I think you'll get, so the bottom line is there's a lot of support. Yeah, you're going to have to look for it. You don't have to leave your computer. You'll have groups and organizations and meetings and lectures. You, there is a lot there if you search for it and you show up for it. So the next question, um, when my husband discloses eight three laps to porn, he initially lied about it. And I said, these are my feelings of unsafe and fear with you. Some are, I feel unsafe when you lie. I feel, I feel fear when you relapse. I feel unsafe when you have no porn blocker on your laptop. I feel unsafe when you blame and twist my words. I feel unsafe you refuse to be transparent with your recovery therapy, et cetera. His response was, I told him he was a bad person, that I hated him 
that I did not give him accolades for his new recovery plan. He became the victim as I invalidated and unheard. This happens often. We are separated and trying to get back together. Dr. Rob, my questions are, one, do sex addicts in solid recovery ever get out of this abusive, addictive behavior and mentality? And two, and I'll come back to that one, is it, is it his deeply embedded shame that is causing this or his antisocial personality disorder? So one, do sex addicts in solid recovery ever get out of this abusive, addictive behavior and okay. mentality? Can you leave this person and never go back? Could you just please leave this person and never go back? You're separated. He slipped eight times. When you express your feelings and needs, he shuts you down and blames you for making him feel bad. Why would you want to be with this person? What do you have to share except the history? And I, I, Tammy, you know, I don't know this person. And Lord knows if you have kids and you have a good life together, try to work it out. I'm always on the side of that. But when I hear, it's hard for me personally, when I hear a woman putting up with what she expresses as a lot of abuse, what she expresses and I hear as a lot of personal violations and a lack of concern or interest in her. And this person has been working on it for a while. I don't think you're asking the right question. I think the right question is, what would be the reason for me to stay in this relationship? See, you're still focused on him. You're saying, I think the questions were, what's wrong with him? Will he grow beyond this? If this, then that about him. It is not about him. How, how long do you want to be with someone who's slipping constantly? How long do you want to be with someone who shuts you down and gets upset with you when you're just trying to tell your truth? How long do you want to be with someone who is tired of your bugging them and just wants to be left alone because they're a piece of crap and that's all they'll ever be. So why are you even bothering with them? That's all shame. That is all shame. To answer your last question, shame doesn't drive us into addiction. Addiction drives us into shame. Um, if it didn't, then we, if, if it was shame that drove us into addiction, then none of us would be able to get sober because I still have shame. <laughs> but you know, it's, acting out and then feeling horrible about it and then hating myself about it is actually a trap because if you admit in the 12 steps that you're powerless over something right at the beginning then you're admitting that you might struggle with it you might have you know that it's going to be a challenge for you so i'm hearing a little narcissism a little perfectionism from your spouse and then you said antisocial personality okay so if you know your husband has an antisocial personality please lock the doors move out get go to another state change your bank account because this person going to hurt you over and over and again and never feel bad about it. And let me tell you folks, as I get ready for dinner, the difference between narcissism, which every addict has and every addict expresses, especially when they're in their addiction, versus someone who's a psychopath or a sociopath. Narcissistic people, we lack empathy. I don't necessarily see how my behavior is going to make you feel. I'll say something that I didn't realize was insulting to you. I'll do something that I didn't realize just diminished you. And I didn't know it. And so I, without thinking about it, did things that would hurt you. We do that all the time. But narcissists, if, I, if you bring my attention, do you see how you hurt this person? Do you realize how they're feeling? Do you really want to do that? I'll feel bad about it. And that's where every narcissistic person is vulnerable to being healed. Because if you don't want to feel this bad about yourself or how you're treating other people, I can help you to never feel that way again. And that's a big open door into healing. But people who are psychopaths and, and sociopaths, not only do they not express empathy, they also don't feel bad about things. So someone who's much more sociopathic is like, well, I'm, yeah, I see how that hurt you now, and I don't really care. It's no big deal. You're just going to have to deal with it. They don't have any desire to make it better because they still don't feel bad, bad about it, even when they see you in pain. That is a sociopath. And someone who doesn't feel any remorse or any empathy along the way, it comes and goes, but doesn't demonstrate to me that they really feel bad about having hurt me, even though they may not have seen it coming. I can't help that person because without remorse, if this person doesn't feel pain about having hurt you, then they don't have any reason not to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And that's very sociopathic. So most sociopaths end up in prison, not all, unfortunately. There's a great book I'd recommend you read, and then I'm going to go called The Sociopath Next Door. And it's a book by a woman who understands psychology. She saw on the kind of research how many people are sociopaths. And then she looked at all the people in prison and she was like, gosh, there are a lot more people out there in the world than I thought who were sociopaths because they're not all in prison. And they are. They're the person who uses you, takes advantage of you. But unlike an addict, they're going to say, oh, well, I'll just move on to the next person because they don't have any feeling for how they've hurt you. 
So there is a difference between somebody who might take a really long time to begin to feel your pain, um, feel your empathy and grow toward you. And then they're the ones who just make you feel bad for even expressing what you, what you feel bad about, even if it's their fault. And that's someone that's best walked away from. So on that cheery note, thank you all for being here tonight. Come back next week. And there's lots more resources on sexandrelationshiphealing.com. So join those. Uh, for those of you that we didn't get to your questions tonight, sorry. We always run out of time. So come back next week and ask early or join Dr. Rob on his In the Rooms group on Friday night at 6 p.m. It's free. You do have to have a membership, but in the rooms.com. Um, and the next Super Saturday Recovery Summit is July 18th. So and stay tuned. one more thing to remind yes. you in case you've forgotten, because we don't make any money off of this, but it helps a lot of people, is I have a really popular podcast called Sex, Love, and Addiction. We have almost half a million people have sat down and listened to it. I have some of the most well regarded therapists in the world talking about addiction and mental health and relationships and betrayal. So if you have a chance to listen to sex, love, and addiction, drop by. Tammy and I also have a new podcast called Overcoming Betrayal and Addiction. And right. it's all set up. We're just waiting for iTunes to approve it. And then it, then you'll be able to find it. But I, I did all the work to get that all connected. So I checked this morning and they still hadn't approved it, but I'll check tomorrow morning. And if you like us live, you're going to love us on tape. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. Tammy, We're better have a great on evening. Tape. <laughs> we can edit ourselves. Here you have go. a great night. You too. Thanks, Thanks for your help, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.